to that the chick has fledged. And these animals are incredibly slow growing and they take years to mature. Um, an albatross can take up to 10 years to become sexually mature. These animals are extremely vulnerable to overfishing. And for example, a wandering albatross, this wingspan is more than twice my height. Wandering albatross, it can be over, um, one, one wing can be over two meters long. It's an amazingly huge bird. They travel for more than a thousand kilometers per day. Top predators are incredibly important in stabilizing the marine ecosystem. Um, the presence of these animals gives you an idea of how healthy the ecosystem is. And of course, with seabirds, they give an indication because they spend a lot of their time at sea, but they breed on land. Scientists can use their pellets and the, their, their foraging activity. They can use this as an indicator to see how well the, the, fishing is, the fish are doing in the marine ecosystem. And so with this huge problem of overfishing, is aquaculture the answer? And indeed it can be. One in every four fish eaten today is farmed. But of course, farmed seafood also has its own issues. And it can be a, one, of the, one of the solutions to overfishing if it's done in a responsible way. But I'll give you an idea of some of the problems that, that aquaculture has associated with it. For example, if we look at something like feed ratio, if we're looking at something like salmon or trout that is harvested, these are carnivorous fish, so obviously they will need other fish to be able to sustain them. And often it takes four kilograms of wild fish to produce just one kilogram of farmed fish. And if this is the case, are we really helping with overfishing? Because ultimately that was why aquaculture was thought about in the first place, developed. It was to be an answer, one of the answers to overfishing. And so obviously, if we are farming carnivorous fish, we are potentially increasing the demand for an overexploited species. If you think about something like environmental damage, for those of us that, that love prawns, um, it's estimated that about 25% of the world's mangrove swamps have been cleared away for farming of prawns. And this is, this is quite, a, it has interesting repercussions for the livelihoods of people that are dependent on these mangrove swamps for their, for their food and for their, um, they, they subsist off these, off these lands. And of course, if you're, if you're farming something like trout or some carnivorous fish, there's the added um, double whammy, so to speak, of disease and possible waste management. If you're farming with fish that can escape and a, a disease breaks out amongst these fish and they do escape, this can of course lead to disease landing up in, in wild populations. And there's the, also the potential um, risk of genetic fouling. And then of course waste management, if you're putting a whole lot of feed into, the, into these farms and this leaks out of the farms, it can, it can lead to over nutrification in the, in the wild. So what is driving this? I just show this, I show this, um, this picture just for you to have an idea of what the contribution of fish to animal protein supply is in the world. If you guys can see where the hashed areas are, like here, here. those are the areas where the contribution of fish protein, fish protein to animal protein is over 20%. So you have an idea of how many people in this world depend on fish. And so every one of us that actually enjoys fish or gloves going out to seafood restaurants, we are contributing to this in some small incremental way. And as our world population increases, this is what is driving the overfishing. So we've got growing appetites and shrinking seas. It's estimated that per capita, we'd, we're eating about 14 kilograms more fish now than we did in the 60s. And so now after all this overwhelming information, is it even possible that consumers can make a difference with this information. What do you do with this information? Where do you start? What can we do to make a difference? What is needed is an ecosystem approach to fisheries management and what that ultimately means is not looking at one species in um, isolation. You need to think about the entire ecosystem and think how everything relates to everything else how removing one species or a lot of one species is going to affect another species. You need to think about that. And that's what our program does. We work from boat to plate, so to speak. We're at the interface between civil society and the private sector as well as the government and we work holistically through the seafood supply chain. So as I mentioned, we work with the fishing industry, we help train them, we help them understand why the rules are as they are. We work with suppliers and restaurants and retailers, helping them understand 
that sustainable seafood should be their business. They need to shift their, demand, their, their supply from overexploited species to sustainable species if they hope to continue with their businesses. But ultimately, it's the consumer that drives this, and that's why a lot of our effort is placed into making consumers aware, educating them about the issues. Because a restaurant and the retailer, when we work with them, they often say to us, well, the consumers aren't demanding this, so why should I put effort into it? Why should I be investing in a species that is not popular? So ultimately, the consumer is what drives this entire chain. It's very important. <coughs> And so what we tell consumers, the number one thing to remember is not all seafood is equal. And so there are certain questions that every seafood consumer should ask. What is it? Oftentimes, I don't know if a lot of you guys watched Carte Blanche last year, they had this huge um, expose on mislabeling and oftentimes a restaurant will sell a cheap fish under the guise of a more expensive fish so that they can get more money for it. It's a consumer's right to know what is on their plate, to know what it is that they are eating. So you need to ask, what is it? You need to ask, where does it come from? Different regions of the world have different fishing management measures in place. It's important to know where your fish comes from. And how is it caught? Because as I mentioned before, different fishing measures, different fishing ways have different effects. So you need to know, okay, is it long line core take or is it